Good morning. Thank you for uh, uh, joining us this morning. I'm Steve Brower, the director of the Left Court Cancer Center at uh, Englewood uh, Health. Uh, we are a full service cancer center just outside of uh, New York City. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us at our annual Left Court Cancer Center Symposium. This year's topic during Lung Cancer Awareness Month is uh, discussing uh, screening, diagnosis, and uh, treatment of uh, uh, lung cancer. Um, like uh, many of you, many cancer centers, uh, we have many disease management teams and lung cancer is one of them. It is, however, perhaps the most prominent of our lung cancer managements because of the magnitude of the problem. As you all know, every minute, probably perhaps two men and one woman succumb to lung cancer. Uh, like your cancer centers, it is diagnosed uh, in, in our particular region at an extremely high rate and represents the worst of healthcare disparities as uh, well. Um, this morning, our agenda includes uh, uh, clinical discussions, uh, multidisciplinary care of lung cancer, and evidence-based research that supports our treatment each day. You'll meet seven of our uh, most uh, highly subspecialized lung cancer experts, giving us uh, short uh, highlights of their expertise and experience diagnosing and uh, treating patients with lung cancer. <clears throat> I wanna talk about a few housekeeping items before we get started. We wanna thank our uh, corporate sponsors, AtroCare and Olympus for their unrestricted educational uh, grants. So let's keep these things in mind. Please keep your microphones uh, muted. You'll be able to send any questions through our uh, chat box for review during a Q&A at 9.45 a.m. At the end, please complete questionnaires you will receive to qualify for your Category 1 uh, uh, CMEs. And also, uh, you'll receive a, a, a giveaway uh, courtesy of Englewood Health. Um, our recording will be available on our website. And then our Cancer Center Administrator, Christina Laird, is available at that uh, email to uh, answer any questions. So with that in mind, I'd like to uh, move directly to our uh, uh, sessions. Um, I also said that we will have a 10 minute break, if I didn't say this, from 9.20 to 9.30 a.m. Uh, for some clinical case study presentations. So our first speaker is Dr. Mark Shapiro, who is the chief of radiology and uh, uh, one of the architects of our lung cancer screening diagnosis <laughs> program here. And this morning, uh, Dr. Shapiro will be talking about lung cancer screening, the role of low dose CT scan. Thank you, Dr. Brower. Welcome to everyone joining our symposium. As we start, why lung cancer screening, CT? We all know lung cancer, number one bleeding cancer killer death in this country, males and females combined. The unfortunate statistic is that it is shown that between 15 to 18% of these patients who we diagnose, we are diagnosing early stage. 85% of patients who present come to us advanced stages three, four disease where we all know the, the prognosis and the treatment options are limited. The CT lung cancer screening, why now? CT, it's been in the radiology world for, for decades. However, as the technology has progressed, we're able to get thinner slices, which we need to find these small nodules and employing a low dose radiation technique. 2006, the first article, first study was published 15 years ago. So this is really not anything brand new. This study had 32,000 patients. They diligently screened patients 
85% of the lung cancer is detected for stage one. And that is our goal. And that's what we are working towards. That study, study was followed up four years later, 2010, National Cancer Institute. Randomized trial, definite conclusion, 20% decrease in mortality in lung cancer death for patients undergoing screening. This study was prematurely stopped because of these great results. And just as a statistic, the study showed that we needed to screen over 300 patients to prevent one lung cancer death. Risks and benefits. What, what is the benefit? As we just said, a definite 20% decreased mortality, diagnosing early stage. With the benefit needs to be a risk. The actuality is there's really very minimal risk to this study. This CT is a simple study. It's done within minutes. There's patients are not injecting any contrast and not drinking anything. They get on the table and they are done literally scanning time within seconds. False positives is an issue. However, in the, in the proper hands of experienced diagnostic radiologists, we know how to minimize the false positives. The other issue, radiation. We all know radiation is not good, but we just want to put things in perspective. Anyone living in the United States walking around every day is exposed to three and a half millisieverts of radiation. If you like to ski, you live in Denver, high altitude, add one and a half. That's five millisieverts. CT lung cancer screening, one millisievert. It, it, it is such a low dose that it's almost irrespective <coughs> of any significant risk going forward. As a radiation, as a radiologist working with radiation, I'm allowed to get five millisieverts a year. So it is such a low dose, they're really almost imperceptible. So who are we screening? A major decision was made just a few months ago this year. Age, previously 55 to 74, the age range has been expanded significantly. So currently the recommendation, screening patients fall into 50 to 80 years old, 50 to 80. With smoking history has been diminished from a previous 30 pack year history to 20 pack year history, increasing by far the population that should be available to have these studies. The perils of this process, a recent study utilizing the older literature showed that less than half of patients who we diagnose for lung cancer actually fit into these screening guidelines. So these are guidelines. Complicated slide. The point is that it, these studies are interpreted in a very specific fashion, which is eliminating our false positives. So what is our experience here at Englewood? We started formally seven years ago, 2014. We've scanned over 2,500 patients. Our cancer detection rate on a screening study is 1.25%. National average, one to 2%. That's what we're expecting to find. Want to run through a quick series of cases as a radiologist, what are we looking for? This is a 74 year old patient, comes in for a screening, CT. We could see on the screen a 1.1 centimeter suspicious spiculated mass. This is gonna be lung cancer. We, as a, in our diagnostic testing, the next step is a CT PET. We could see the activity here. The main point of the PET scan is not so much looking at that primary nodule, which we know is gonna be positive, looking at everything else. We're, we're screening this patient and we're doing a clinical stage, which helps the clinicians to further progress on the diagnostic workup. One of the statistics that's critical to know is that within this country, Three years ago, the statistics came out that less than 5% of the population in the United States who fit our criteria, and they're just criteria, were able to undergo a CT lung cancer screening. The statistics just came out within a, the last month that we're currently in this country, 12% of patients who fit the criteria are currently being scanned. So the point is that we have a long way to go and that this test has shown to be beneficial. And I wanna show one more case here where this is a patient 
72 year old who presented with a significant finding over two centimeter curvilinear mass like density. This patient on soft tissue windows, a large subcarinal mediastinal lymph node, looking into the upper abdomen, a large metastatic lesion in the vertebral body. This was stage four disease on presentation. This patient had a CAT scan three years prior to the current study. The CT was negative, normal. So a very important point, besides the screening guidelines, who are we screening? CT screening is not a one and done. This is an annual study that must be performed. We don't want patients coming in for one study. It's negative, that's great. I'll come back in five years, take another look. It doesn't work that way. Just like females get a mammogram every year, this has to be done every single year. It's absolutely critical. The other thing about the process, the program, is that this has to be combined with smoking cessation. We do not want patients coming in, getting a negative study, and feeling that's carte blanche. I could continue smoking because that is a study that's, if I develop lung cancer, I'm going to be cured. So although uncommon, we have definitely seen patients who have a negative CT come back not even a year later, but six months later with symptoms, and they have advanced disease. We don't understand the entire biology. We're working on screening classifications. Again, these are guidelines, but every patient is different. We have to keep in mind the clinical scenario, but the point is we must screen, and when any, there's any doubt, patients falling slightly out of the guidelines, screen these patients in a diligent fashion. We have come a long way, but we have a long way to go. This is a great test that has been proven to save lives. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shapiro. Uh, we'll continue now with the uh, uh, diagnosis of lung cancer. And I'd like to introduce Dr. David Shu, one of our uh, pulmonary and uh, critical care physicians and uh, central to our uh, lung cancer disease management. Uh, David will be talking about the modern uh, diagnostics uh, involved with lung cancer. Thank you, Dr. Brower. Welcome and good morning. Um, so today we'll be discussing about the diagnosis of lung cancer and non-surgical approach as, as we find different lung nodules as per Dr. Shapiro's uh, great talk just now. So just a quick outline of what we'll be discussing today is our non-surgical approach, which includes a bronchoscopy. When should we refer to a pulmonologist, uh, oncologist, or a thoracic surgeon? The diagnosis and interventional process that we can also perform, as well as the importance of using a bronchoscopic approach for a lung cancer stage. So when do you all want to refer? Um, so with our lung cancer screening, we generally want to refer all high-risk patients, as well as <clears throat> incidental lung nodules that found there are six millimeters in size. In addition to that, any persistent bulky adenopathy or persistent adenopathy seen on your surveillance CAT scans, uh, whether for lung cancer screening or otherwise, should be evaluated by one of our specialists. So in terms of planning, Dr. Shapiro uh, greatly discussed about the lung cancer screening program that we have here and is vital to our lung cancer program. In addition to that, the PET scan offer, also offers us a better diagnostic tool. But at the end of the day, with our diagno diagnosis, location, location, location is the key to allowing us to diagnose a patient with lung cancer, whether surgically or through a bronchoscopic approach. So the old fashioned way of doing this is basically old school bronchoscopy, direct visualization, whether flexible or rigid, where we allow to inspect the airway. However, you know, sampling, uh, technology has improved greatly over the last few years uh, with the use of electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy, as well as endobronchial ultrasound, otherwise known as EVIS. Here at Englewood, we also offer a rapid on-site evaluation, otherwise called ROSE, to allow us to adequately obtain sample uh, material that is specific to what we're looking for during the procedure. So the standard bronchoscopy we have here is, again, for inspection of the endobronchial lesions. We're able to utilize this for fluoroscopic approaches, um, as well as inspection of central lesions. However, the limitations that we find here is that we are unable to stage the mediastinum with our old-fashioned approach. Um, and in addition to that, we're also unable to accurately 
obtain peripheral nodules or access them in an appropriate, accurate manner. And that's where electro navigation bronchoscopy and EBIS come into play, which we have here at Englewood. So this is just a quick picture of the old fashioned bronchoscopy with fluoroscopy that we usually do here. As you can see, it's just a two dimensional approach here with a simple bronchoscopy and a four step <coughs> biopsy um, to the right apical area of the lung. However, the limitations include the fact that we don't have a 3D approach and as in the real world, we may not have an accurate biopsy and how trustworthy are we of this? That's where electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy comes into play. It allows us to access peripheral nodules with newer technologies that have been um, present in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, what it does is that we place a proximity board along the patient's chest wall. And with this, it emits a electromagnetic wave that is synchronized to our DICOM CT images that were done through Englewood. Through this, we're able to utilize a locatable guide or otherwise called an LG to access peripheral nodules that otherwise could not be accessed through a, uh, the old fashioned bronchoscopy. We can do this through a three dimensional approach um, and allows us to track and position and place um, any tools that we need to uh, be done at the lung nodule of, of concern. So what do we do here in Englewood with the electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy. We start with the CT images uh, that we are done through the lung cancer screening and other images that we may need to be done. Thereafter, we do a planning and navigation software where we reconstruct the airways. And through this, we're able to guide our bronchoscope followed by our LG <coughs> locatable guide to uh, the area of concern where we're able to access through the working channel our tools of choice. So just a sample, this is what we do with our CT images that we obtain in Inglewood, where we recreate a 3D image of our airways. This allows us to create a map or roadmap to the air, to the lung lesion of choice. Thereafter, what we do is through an, uh, the CT, an axial image, we locate the lung nodule of concern and we trace that lung nodule to the airways that we've mapped prior. 3D reconstruction through an axial, coronal, and sagittal view of the, of the lung nodule is obtained where we then recreate a roadmap to the area of concern. As can be seen here in our quick video, what we've done is then recreate the roadmap of our airways that allow us to guide just like a GPS system with a bronchoscope through the airways. Now we're reaching the carina here and at the same time, I would be using my bronchoscope to follow along in real imaging through the airways following these purple lines. At a point, my bronchoscope will be limited through this diam diameter into the airways, where then around here, I will introduce my LG and continue following the purple lines where I will obtain my goal target, which is the green dot here, or we call a golf ball, where I'm able to access with my tools through, through my LG and obtain tissue sampling. This is, this is vital due to the fact that my bronchoscope otherwise would, have, would not have reached this area, but with 3D reconstruction and orientation, I'm able to do so in a virtual environment. So through this, we will use then a fluoroscopy to ensure that we are number one, accurately there in a 2D perspective, and also to ensure that we're not too far out peripherally, as at times <clears throat> 3D reconstruction may have and <clears throat> may be off its axis. So we want to ensure that we're not at the peripherally, potentially causing a pneumothorax. With the with electro electro navigation bronchoscopy, we are also able to use this as a treatment approach. Well, or, or helps our radiation radiation oncologist treat the patient by allowing us to target the lesions. We're also able to place fiducial markers, which will help direct SBRT as well as possible localization for surgical resection with dye placement as well. Next here at Ingle, but we also have endobronchial ultrasound biopsy. Um, this is a, basically a simple bronchoscope with a convex probe tip located at the tip of the bronchoscope. It offers real-time imaging of lymph nodes, blood vessels, and masses, and allows us to have a transbronchial needle aspiration biopsy of, the, of any um, adenopathy or masses. It allows for a minimum invasive approach, and it also obviates the need for invasive venous stenoscopy as we've done in the past. Not only does it help with lung cancer diagnosis, but it can also help us diagnose sarcoid lymphoma and other endobronchial masses, lesions, or adenopathies. So it's a quick picture of what we have here in Englewood, where we have a convex probe tip, um, and through the channel, we have the aspiration needle. 
And through this, we're able to visualize mediastinal uh, lymph nodes in a real-time imaging. Also allows us to access the at a blood vessel, artery and veins, so that we can avoid this uh, and also avoid any complications with bleeding risks. Once cleared, we can place our needle into the adenopathy and obtain transbronchial needle aspiration biopsies for our pathologist to review. Well, the purpose of this EVIS is also through station staging. Um, this is the basic roadmap that we have, that we use throughout the board, and it allows us and the radiologist, as well as the pathologist, to understand where we are obtaining our biopsies, and it also allows us for staging. This is vital for the fact that it allows us for a new different language amongst us and amongst um, any physician to allow us to know where the lymph node of concern was and how far away and close we are to the lesion of choice. Again, we'll be talking about TNM staging uh, and with our diagnosis through non-invasive, non-surgical approaches, we're able to apply this to our TNM staging, which we further discuss by our surgical and oncologist um, at this time. I wanna thank you very much. And I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Brower to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Shu. That was really a very elegant presentation. Uh, we appreciate your patience. Our next speaker is off-site, so uh, we had to have our extraordinary capable uh, uh, IT group working with us. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Lyle Gorenstein, and uh, Lyle is a, a extraordinarily experienced uh, thoracic uh, surgeon, uh, integral part of our lung disease management team. We'll be talking about the surgical management of early stage lung cancer this morning. Uh -huh. All right, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Here we go. Okay, thanks, Steve. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I just got to get back to my PowerPoint. There we go. Here we go. Terrific. Can you guys all hear? Yes. Terrific. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm going to give a brief presentation about uh, surgical management of early stage lung cancer. Um, along with the evolution of surgery, there's a, been a profound evolution in the staging of lung cancer. The first iteration was published in 1986 by Cliff Mountain out of MD Anderson. And uh, he presented the TNM staging for lung cancer. I had the profound uh, uh, opportunity to, to work with Cliff Mountain from 1989 to 1990 while I was at MD Anderson and help mine the database. The initial database consisted of 3,700 patients. 10 years later, it was expanded to 5,000. And over the last 30 years, there's now been eight iterations in a combination with AJCC and the International uh, Association for the Study of Lung Cancer. Critical in the last iteration has been the splitting of the T1 categories into three different state, uh, three different categories, T1, A, B, and C based on size. And the other main contribution of the last uh, iteration was the division of the M1 categories. For the surgeons, the early state, the earlier sizes helps guide our therapy. And for the oncologists, the more advanced stages, especially with the new molecular markers that are available and the new agents that uh, facilitate the treatment of advanced diseases making profound effects. Over here, you can see this slot, this uh, survival stage, which you'll probably see many times today. And obviously 
you can see the earlier lung cancer is identified and treated, the better the survival. Well, we're trying to catch up with you with your slides uh, advancing. So just give us a second. Well, I should be advancing them from here. You didn't see my slides? Uh, you can go ahead and share your screen. There we go. Okay. In, in 1992, when I was back in, working at University of Toronto, myself and with some colleagues published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, this review staging the key to the rational management of lung cancer. Over the last 30 years, nothing has really changed except our accuracy and our ability to stage lung cancer more uh, minimally invasively and help us select the ideal therapies. This is an important slide because it plays into the importance of lung cancer screening. This is from data collected in California uh, database of, uh, it was about 60 or 70,000 patients. And in this upper graph, you see the natural history of untreated early, early lung cancers, T1, T2 cancers in patients who, who, who for whatever reason did not undergo any treatment whatsoever, be it surgery or radiation therapy. And you can see what, what the natural survival is and, and, and the curves eventually go to zero. And by five years, there are very few patients who had actually, who were surviving. And in the lower graph, you can see the, the, uh, the, the difference in treated versus untreated untreated T1 and T2 lung cancers. And the five-year survival for the treated patients was 54%, whereas those patients who, who refused for whatever reason to be treated, their five-year survival was 11%. Here's a, a PET scan, which gives some indication what the natural history of lung cancer is. This was a 75-year-old gentleman who had a CAT scan, was found to have a PET-positive uh, lesion in the right upper lobe, highly suspicious for a primary lung cancer, refused therapy, disappeared for a year, came back, had a follow-up CAT scan followed by a PET scan, and now you can see he has N2 disease. So over that one-year interval, this cancer evolved from a curable T1 N0 cancer to a, a T1 N2 cancer with an estimated five-year survival, even with our best molecular uh, uh, therapies now in the range of 20 to 25%. And similarly, here's a indication of the need for ongoing scanning. This is a, a woman who was getting scans once a year. However, she missed her annual scan because of COVID. CT on the left here was 18 months prior to the CT on the right. You CT on the right here shows a three centimeter lesion. Uh, she went on to have a PET CT. The lesion was positive with no evidence of disease in the hilum or mediastinum, followed by a lobectomy, but at surgery was found to have N1 disease. So her, her, her tumor in that one year of, or 18 month interval evolved from nothing to being a stage two lung cancer. Now this is impacted obviously by the biology and lung cancer screening doesn't save everyone. In fact, the, the large database showed that only 80% of the cancers that were picked up by screening were of stage one, indicating 20% of totally asymptomatic patients can have more advanced disease. So that's, um, there's not, screening is not going to find every early lung cancer and some people are going to uh, succumb because of their biology. Now, mediastinoscopy had, has been traditionally our, our method of staging the mediastinum, introduced in 1962 by Griff Pearson from the University of Toronto, who's really the grandfather of thoracic surgery, responsible for training more thoracic surgeons in North America than anyone else. He spent uh, several months with Carlins in Sweden and brought back the mediastinoscope. At the time, there was uh, only a, a ability to, to, to uh, stage lung cancer was thoracotomy. 
it was prior to CT, prior to PET, and the mediastinoscope had a, a profound impact in reducing the number of unnecessary or unresectable patients at thoracotomy. And over those, the last 50 years, not only has there been an evolution in surgical techniques, there's been an evolution in imaging with CT scan evolving to PET CT and mediastinoscopy evolving to endobronchial ultrasound and biopsying. But all these modalities are critical in selecting the correct patients for surgery. Here's a, images of, of a CT scan in the PET. And this, this information we're using in conjunction with uh, patient factors, risk factors, such as smoking history, age of patient, the, the um, uh, uh, radiographic imaging uh, in regards to the size and suspicion of a lesion based on its uh, characteristics. And, and PET scan would be used to help characterize the nodule, but also to exclude the evidence of uh, spread to the lo locally into the hilum or mediastinum and distally to uh, brain, adrenals, uh, liver, et cetera. And a lesion like this with high suspicion of malignancy would be directly resected. There's no need to do a CT guide biopsy or a transbronchial biopsy because of the high propensity for this to be malignant. And thoracoscopy, we can put the scope into the chest, have a using our um, uh, instruments to palpate the nodule, look for visceral pleural changes. Here, I've just placed a, a skin marker on the lesion to make it uh, obviously apparent, and then using a linear stapler can resect this lesion. Thoracoscopy and, and uh, 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 treating lung cancer begun in approximately 1990. It was somewhat limited, mostly because of instrumentation. By 1992, the manufacturers of, of uh, stapling devices or began to catch up with the thoracic surgeons and staplers that had been used for open resections now evolved and uh, were uh, elongated and and uh, streamlined so we could so they could be inserted into the chest through small incisions allowing us to perform thoracoscopic lobectomies. The first one being done approximately in 1992. And uh, in New York, I believe by 1994, uh, we were doing VATS lobectomies at New York Presbyterian. And by the late 1990s, there was accumulated database throughout the world showing the uh, benefits of thoracoscopy and lobectomy. Um, and as over the next 20 years, it evolved to become the standard of care. Now, as a screening has evolved um, and our ability to diagnose earlier lung cancers has evolved, so is our surgical therapy. And this shows uh, three images, the uh, coronal, sagittal, and axial of a ground glass lesion. And um, uh, we, we have developed a, an awareness that these type, these lesions are early lung cancers and over time will in many people evolve into an invasive cancer. So there's now um, uh, the ability for us to not only diagnose, but to remove them through lung sparing procedures. And we use navigational bronchoscopy to help identify intraoperatively where these lesions are. And in this patient in the operating room, the navigational bronchoscope was directed into the lesion. And then we marked the visceral pleura with an indelible ink. And then as the scope is placed into the pleural space, we know where the lesion is. And we can either do a sublobar resection, either by a wedge resection or a segmental resection, thereby sparing the majority of, of lung, but yet uh, uh, removing this lesion and preventing the evolution into an invasive cancer. So in summary, lobectomy and, and uh, uh, thoracoscopic lobectomy and segmentectomy has become the standard of care for managing early uh, stage lung cancers. Um, it's oncologically is, is equivalent to an open resection. It reduces length of stay. There's improved survival for a variety of reasons. 
Um, in patients who require adjuvant therapy, it allows them to start therapy much sooner because the recovery is faster. But more important, it was really allowing us to extend the uh, surgical options to people who otherwise may not have been operable due to advanced COPD, advanced age, medical uh, comorbidities, and multifocal lung cancer. Here's a good example. This was a, this is a very typical patient that we're seeing in our practice now. There's been an evolution of cancer away from a disease of men. Now it, the, the, in, the incidence in women is, is increasing. Um, when I trained, about half of our patients were active smokers. Now about one in 10 of our patients are active smokers. A typical patient now is a woman ex-smoker who has a, uh, either a screening CAT scan or a CAT scan for other indication and is found to have multiple abnormalities. And here you can see in the anterior segment, right upper lobe is a lesion, um, um, superior segment of the lower lobe, and then the contralateral lung is a, a, a lesion deep within the left upper lobe. And she had staged resections, a, a segment from the right upper lobe, superior segment from the right lower lobe, followed by three months later, a left upper lobectomy. And this kind of therapy is, 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 is doable using minimally invasive surgery and segmental resection. So in summary, early detection of lung cancer saves lives. Management of lung nodules is determined by uh, many clinical factors, imaging, and patient factors. We can reliably identify lesions intraoperatively using uh, standard thoracoscopic techniques or with the use of navigational bronchoscopy. Vatsalobectomy is gold standard, and segmental resection is becoming a an increasing important uh, part of the surgical armamentarium as we are uh, uh, identifying earlier and smaller lung cancers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lyle. That was a extraordinary talk. It brings together all of our uh, discussions this morning of the screening, uh, uh, understanding of uh, staging, and then the modern utilization of uh, parenchymal sparing approaches uh, for the treatment of uh, lung cancer. Our uh, next speaker will continue in the area of uh, surgical management of this disease is uh, Dr. Christos uh, Stavropoulos. And uh, Dr. Stavropoulos is a extraordinary robotic surgeon, but uh, as importantly, is one of the directors of our entire uh, thoracic oncology program here in the Left Court Cancer Center. This morning, Dr. Stavropoulos will be talking about the surgical management of locally advanced uh, non-small cell lung cancer and the role of robotics. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you, and it's an honor to share the podium with uh, such distinguished colleagues. This is the agenda for the next 10 minutes, so let's get to it. Locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer typically refers to any lung cancer that has spread to neighboring tissues, structures, or lymph nodes. It's typically classified as stage two or stage three disease, and it comprises about a third of the non-small cell lung cancer patient population we serve. Unfortunately, about 80% of these patients are typically unresectable. And when they do get to uh, stage three, as you can see here, the prognosis is dismal. This schematic, points out to the heterogeneity of stage three disease. These are typical T3 lesions, all of which can be resected and blocked. These are T4 lesions that can also be resected and blocked. But mind you, if you look at some of these on this side of the screen, 
are typically unresectable, particularly when they involve the great vessels in the heart. This is another type of stage three disease, and I'd like us to focus on uh, the N2 lymph nodes. These are typically ipsilateral, subcarinal, and paratracheal lymph nodes. These are very important lymph nodes, and we will be discussing these in detail in the ensuing slides. In general, there's an unmet need in resectable lung cancer. Take, if you will, a stage 1A3 lesion, the size of a grape. That in itself has about a 20% recurrence rate. When that lesion grows to the size of a golf ball, it then uh, the recurrence rate gets up to 35%. Once lymph nodes are involved, as you can see here, the prognosis worsens considerably. So here is the key. We need to get to these lesions early, and we need to resect them for cure. When we work up patients with locally advanced lung cancer, we're basically doing two things. We're assessing operability and resectability. Resectability is uh, basically doing comprehensive staging. Every patient with locally advanced lung cancer needs a PET scan, needs a brain, a brain MRI with contrast to rule out occult intracranial metastasis, and then needs to undergo a pathologic mediastinal lymph node evaluation. So when to EBIS or when to not to EBIS? That is the question. <laughs> Obvious indications is if you have clinical N1 or N2 disease on imaging, that's pretty obvious. But not so obvious is when we have central tumors or tumors that are greater than three centimeters in size, even if they're in the periphery of the lung. And this is regardless of PET. As you can see here, a lot of these pulmonary and thoracic societies throughout the world have accepted these as guidelines. N2 disease can basically be broken down into three categories. There's infiltrative N2 disease, which is bulky and, in, and, and invasive of, of major mediastinal structures. And this is typically non-operative disease. Discrete N2 disease is typically referred to as single station, microscopic or non-bulky or single zone. And this typically is operable disease. Occult N2 disease is the disease we find post-resection uh, uh, despite having done the appropriate preoperative workup. Here is a CT scan and a corresponding PET demonstrating the difference between discrete N2 disease and bulky disease. This flow chart taken from the European Society of Thoracic Surgery demonstrates the importance of mediastinal staging. Once we have determined that a patient has non-bulky mediastinal disease, we offer EBIS as the initial uh, staging evaluation. If that EBIS is negative, the patient should undergo a confirmatory mediastinoscopy. If that too is negative for N2 disease, the patient can be offered upfront surgery. Anywhere along this algorithm, if a patient does demonstrate N2 or N3 disease, they are offered multimodality therapy. So the latest version of the NCCN guidelines uh, makes this quite, quite simple to, uh, uh, um, to follow. If there's negative mediastinal disease and the patient is operable, you can go straight to surgery. If they have N2 disease, you determine if it's operable or not. And if it is, patient is offered induction chemo. And then if there's no apparent progression upon restaging, they can proceed to surgery. This is uh, uh, basically recaps all that we have discussed. It's the uh, guidelines from the, from the European Society for Medical Oncology and basically demonstrates the same concepts. N2 disease is critical and is potentially recyclable. We can offer multidisciplinary surgical care. So the take home messages for locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer, staging guides management and N2 status is key. Surgery is offered upfront for N0 and N1 disease. Surgery is offered in a multimodality setting if there's N2 disease and it's typically unresectable disease if the patient demonstrates N3 disease. The anatomic resection of choice is an end block lobectomy or bilobectomy and we typically try to avoid a pneumonectomy. The other thing I'd like to uh, all of us to take home is that multidisciplinary review leads to improved outcomes. This comes in the form of tumor boards, disease management teams, and multidisciplinary clinical uh, pods, all of which we stress here at our cancer center. So switching gears now, why the robot? Well, 
that's basically saying why minimally invasive? Because in the past, a, a, a lesion as small as the one to your left rendered a patient with a large incision, the old dreaded uh, posterior lateral thoracotomy. So this is another depiction of that. And obviously this is why lung cancer surgery in the past was, was so morbid. Uh, the question then is which type of minimally invasive approach, by robotics or robots? Dr. Gorenstein gave a great uh, uh, talk on the, uh, on, on the effectiveness of uh, traditional thoracoscopy. I used to do that myself. I, transi I transitioned over to robotics because of two things, 3D visualization and wristed instruments that, that rendered me uninhibited 360 degree motion. Nevertheless, I always get asked, which is better, robot or bats? And quite honestly, there are oncologically equivalent approaches, even to the open approach. So the key is not how you do it, it's just achieving an R0 resection in a safe, uh, in a safe outcome for the patient. This is a typical setup for the robotic ports. This is how intuitive would like to make you think that the room looks like, but in actuality, it's more like this, quite crowded, but yet it works. This is uh, what I, how I control the robotic arms at the console. I use both hands, both and pretty much uh, all the fingers. And we have again, 360 degree motion. So this is uh, why I consider BATS instruments to be like chopsticks. They have fixed ends, whereas robotic arms have hinge points at their tips and can articulate and give you that 360 degree motion. These are more examples of all the instruments that are, that are at our disposal for the robot. And this is a little caption of a video that demonstrates a robotic uh, lobectomy. In this little uh, video here, this is the uh, apical trunk branch of the main pulmonary artery. This is how we isolate it. And then using a robotic stapler, this is how we transect that one particular branch. Up north is the uh, the left upper lobe, the uh, retractor here is holding the cut end of the bronchus, and the stapler here is going through the superior pulmonary vein. So um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention anything about uh, uh, postoperative recovery. We now use this Atricure device to temporarily freeze uh, the involved intercostal nerves, and this has yielded patients with um, uh, uh, markedly improved postoperative pain control. So uh, we basically freeze the involved nerves to about min minus 90 degrees Celsius. And within a month, at least that's what they say, they get their, uh, they get their uh, function back. So I'd like to end with uh, uh, describing our experience here at the first year of EHP and thoracic surgery. The outpatient experience has now totaled 400 patient visits and we're at four office locales. Uh, our team is growing and it's crucial to our success. And the operative uh, results are as follows. We've done 120 cases, 43 which have been robot. And I'm uh, proud to say that we had no transfusions, return to ORs, intraoperative conversions or mortality. The morbidity is acceptable, but we can do better. And on that, I'll end. Thank you, uh, Christos. Um, again, the theme of um, preservation of normal function and uh, minimal uh, morbidity to the patient is uh, uh, on all of our minds in uh, the treatment of, of all of our cancers, but no greater importance than lung cancer. Um, so we're going to move now away from screening, diagnosis, uh, surgical treatment to uh, really the new paradigm in uh, lung cancer care, which is uh, both the uh, standard and the molecular uh, pathology of, of lung cancer. Uh, we are privileged to have uh, a department of pathology that has formulated subspecialized uh, 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 expertise uh, trained at the highest level cancer centers and uh, we, we have become a center for lung cancer care based on our pathologic uh, expertise as well. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Uh, Mikhail Tismanetsky, 
who is uh, uh, the director of our uh, lung cancer pathology at uh, uh, the Left Heart Cancer Center. Uh, Mike will be talking about uh, conventional and molecular uh, uh, pathology. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I'm going to give you a pathologist perspective into the um, lung cancer. And it used to be that we would subdivide lung cancer into non-small cell lung carcinoma, uh, which is majority of the lung cancers, and that's what we're talking about today, and uh, small cell lung um, cancer. But then it sort of became not enough, and we had to further subdivide uh, non-small cell lung carcinoma to uh, stem cell and adenocarcinoma. And occasionally it's very evident on uh, methoxyl and eosin stains. And sometimes we really um, have um, difficulty differentiating between the two. So we revert to using immunohistochemical stains to help us to differentiate uh, squamous cell carcinoma versus adenocarcinoma. Um, we nowadays would try to minimize the uh, amount of immunohistochemical stains and try to use the most specific stains to help us in that differentiation as we're trying to save more and more tissue for molecular testing. And the molecular subsets of lung cancer is um, it currently you know, evolving um, and more and more mutations are identified. Um, most of them are seen in adenocarcinomas where um, Adenocarcinoma is a majority of lung cancers, and uh, majorities um, of adenocarcinoma have some uh, target of have some mutations. A lot of them um, started with EGFR, but they've been expanding um, with the latest addition of uh, KRAS. Uh, KRAS haven't had a targetable mutation, but this year the new KRAS G12C is the latest addition to this. Um, about a third of uh, KRAS mutations are that particular type which represents about 45% of uh, whole lung cancer. So that biomarkers uh, that we're identifying and targeting are expanding um, all the time. Um, as we all know, NCCM guidelines does recommend um, testing in advance in metastatic disease. Um, and more and more, the recommendation is to uh, testing to be conducted as part of the broad-based molecular profiling. Um, PDL1 testing is also easily performed, and um, a lot of these uh, lung cancers with prior mutations also have PDL1 expression. Uh, we do use uh, targetable therapies first and saving uh, immunotherapy for later in the patients who have prior mutations. Now, um, I'm just going to present a couple of data about the testing rates of actual biomarkers. This is um, from um, a year ago uh, from the Journal of Thoracic Oncology that. Um, the, the point here is that um, we're really underutilizing our, our biomarker testing. So in this data, um, um, this, this is a research survey uh, of about 100, uh, 160 oncologists. And what they found is that academic centers do better than community centers and uh, the private clinics um, tend to do not as well with more and uh, private oncologists using single gene assays. Uh, and you can see the rates of EGFR, ELK, and ROS testing. But when you look at the comprehensive testing that tests all major types of alterations, including point mutations, insertions, and deletions, fusions, and copy number alterations, only 8% of patients with um, metastatic non-small lung cancer uh, had comprehensive testing in the study. Um, this is a more recent uh, article from the Journal of Clinical Oncology of this year, um, where you can see that all, they looked at close to 3,500 patients, and only less than half of these patients, 1,600 of them, had all of these biomarker testing um, that you can see um, on the screen. So the point is that we're still um, underutilizing the biomarker testing, and it's important for us to um, to be aware of it and to uh, prioritize testing in these, um, these patients. Um, so what are some of the challenges? Uh, well, first, you have to think of, uh, of kind of have it at the front of your mind. Um, some of the challenging uh, of obtaining tissue is the tumor location. Sometimes the tum uh, deep-seated tumors can be more difficult to obtain. Um, ability to obtain sufficient tumor uh, can be an issue. Uh, anywhere between 3 and 26% of diagnostic tissue bias biopsies do not have sufficient tissue for molecular testing. So what, what are the things that we do to optimize this to overcome these challenges? So one of them is cytology sampling. So FNA is actually very well suited for molecular testing. Um, and 
it is a minimally invasive with a few complications that are for biopsy. And when you obtain an FNA, uh, you procure true tumor cells, avoiding the uh, adjacent stroma. So you really get true tumor population um, and uh, it's very conducive to molecular testing. It's important to have a rapid onsite evaluation. Um, we, we often are there at the time of the procedure, which sometimes can take can be lengthy, but it's important for us to be there so we can guide the interventional pulmonologist and our interventional radiologist as to how many passes we want and um, ask them for more material if we don't think that there is enough material for molecular testing. But the importance um, is also proactive communication between the clinicians and radiologists and pathologists um, to let them know what, uh, what, the test, what the biopsy is for. If we know ahead of time that the biopsy is uh, for advanced stage of metastatic disease, we can ensure that we obtain sufficient tissue. Upfront sectioning is something that we use in histology. Um, every time the, the tissue block is cut, um, there's a trimming that's involved that uh, loses some of the tissue. So in these cases where there's very limited tissue, we sometimes use upfront sectioning where uh, unstained slides for molecular testing are cut up front, and that reduces turnaround time when the testing is ordered and also minimizes sample loss. Um, and we also use plasma testing as well, and that oftentimes uh, is very helpful and overcomes the scarcity of tissue um, in certain situations. Uh, this is an interesting article that um, talked about uh, um, both tissue and plasma testing, and uh, interestingly, in this, in their hands, the uh, combined approach of plasma testing and tissue testing yielded the higher, highest amount of actionable mutation identified. So um, up to 36% of, of patients with um, advanced non-small cell lung cancer, actually in this case, metastatic non-small lung cancer, had actionable mutations when tested with both tissue and plasma. Um, we use uh, Tempest Laboratory, which is a very well-known um, molecular lab uh, that does testing. And this is um, what, they, what you get from their report. You get the, um, the actionable mutations. Um, you get other biologically relevant mutations. You get pdl one expression. Um, and you have um, tumor mutation burden and microcellulite instability status. And they give you, um, associated with that particular mutation that was identified, they give you the uh, FDA-approved therapies that are currently used, as well as the therapies that could be used in other um, tumor types or other indication. The other important piece of information that we get is the information on clinical trials um, and which trials these patients um, uh, qualified for. So that's very helpful. And we do have a molecular tumor board where these patients are presented and the treatments, the, the actionable mutations are discussed and the treatments is decided. Um, and the last slide, um, I, I wanted to illustrate the importance and um, that uh, Savropoulos mentioned is the importance of multi multidisciplinary tumor board to improve the quality of care. So this study, um, it's about four or five years old now, but um, they looked at um, 70 hospitals and over 16,000 patients and um, really looked at the cost of the working up lung cancer and the, the cost of, uh, of um, care when patients are presented when, when in hospitals that have multidisciplinary multi tumor board is significantly lower than the cost of care in hospitals that do not have that uh, modality as well as the diagnosis to treatment time is significantly lower in hospitals that utilize multidisciplinary care. So I invite all of you to participate in our multidisciplinary tumor boards. Now it's more easier than ever with Zoom um, and it, it yields to better patient care and lower healthcare costs. So um, in summary, you know, I, I demonstrated that the clinical guidelines do recommend broad-based molecular profiling. So we should be using that uh, instead of single gene testing. Um, I talked about some tissue optimization techniques that we use um, and plasma-based testing that can be used concurrently with tissue-based uh, testing as well, and the importance of coordinated multidisciplinary care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tishmanetsky. It really is amazing how we challenge our pathologists uh, with both the conventional and the molecular uh, uh, pathology diagnosis. Um, 
we'll have more to say about our uh, molecular pathology tumor board and I'd like to understand your experience as well during our Q&A. Our next um, uh, speaker is one of the directors of our thoracic oncology program here in the Left Heart Cancer Center and the uh, chief of thoracic onco uh, medical oncology, Dr. Lou Addis. Uh, Dr. Addis is an extraordinarily experienced medical oncologist and has really uh, uh, shifted uh, to the uh, modern techniques, diagnostics, and interventions that allow us to see for the first time in patients with more advanced disease, survival curves that are plateaued that demonstrate uh, durable survival. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Addis who will talk about therapy paradigms for stage four uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the uh, invite, Steve. And uh, thank you for the unbelievable task of trying to handle all of the therapy of lung cancer, stage four, in 10 minutes. I'm on. Uh, new therapies in lung cancer are appearing daily. If I blink, I miss the <laughs> approval of an adjuvant immunotherapy in resected stage two or a new drug for a targeted gene. This is an exciting time to be a medical oncologist. We are truly extending patients' lives. As in other cancers, adenocarcinoma of the lung is not one disease, but many arising from years of mutational pressures of inhaled hydrocarbons and smokers, and the same or other unknown pressures in patients in light, stopped, or non-smokers can lead to a single gene mutations in critical pathways in cell development, which drive a malignant phenotype. See if this works. Here we go. The concept of precision medicine, as it pertains to lung cancer, is to define and rapidly find a unique molecular or immunologic phenotype, use the data to treat the patient to get a better outcome. The end point, of course, we hope one day will be a cure. As Dr. Tiz eloquently showed us, we now use uh, driver mutations found by NGS, which is rapid genetic sequencing, and ctDNA, uh, where liquid biopsies are utilized. We don't rely on chemotherapy alone. This is what we're going to talk about. I borrowed this slide from Ben Levy, who used to be at Mount Sinai, who's a big proponent of liquid biopsy. <laughs> but in fact, when you expand the role of a medical oncologist today, we're part of a team. And the, you hear the word multidisciplinary team. We meet frequently and we discuss frequently. And we discuss earlier. Patients don't come to me with a diagnosis in hand. I get called before the diagnosis is made. So we can help to coordinate in those patients with state advancing stage disease, both the molecular and the immunologic. It is so important to get the right diagnosis day one so that you can get the proper therapy. Unfortunately, a lot of lung cancer patients at stage four, if treated improperly, would go to palliative care at stage two. I believe testing extends lives. We at Englewood do use the NCCN and the ASCO guidelines. We try very hard to recommend testing in all appropriate patients. This is an early observation by Mark Chris at Memorial that non-small cell lung cancers that had a driver mutation behaved differently. Now this is 2014. There's only gefitinib and allotinib. Those are not very active drugs. But in fact, two-year survival of 80% versus a 50% to your survival with conventional chemotherapy in stage four. Okay, this is the tough slide. So it's complicated. And I, and I stole this from uh, EORTC, but I want you to start on the left side where we have all the oncogenic drivers, EGFR, ALK, ROS, BRAF, HER2, and TRAC, and MED. And below them, the first and second line therapy. This is paradigm for any stage four patients. We need this stuff first. If these are negative, we move over to the right side, where we look at the amount of PDL1 or TMB to guide our immunotherapy. Basically, on the left side, 
where the tumors are driver gene negative, you're looking at a combination of a doublet chemotherapy with an immunotherapy added to it. There are variations in the immunotherapy. There is even doublet immunotherapy for the patients who wish it. Some generalizations about targeted versus immune therapy for the clinicians. Driver genes are much more common in light and non-smokers. They're typically single gene mutations at the start, but after therapy, you actually could develop double mutations. We believe these cancers are less immunogenic. I'll tell you why later. Um, Smoking-related cancers have more mutations. Our immunotherapy may be better in that population. Tis showed us a little bit about the heterogeneity. This is an older slide. I think back in 17, Tis, we were testing for EGFR and ALK. We were doing it in sequence. We waited for EGFR. If that was negative, we did ALK. Now we rapidly have to have 10 drivers, and we need them early. So early on, we want to do our NGS or liquid if we don't have enough tissue, or complementary, because I actually try to do both in order to get the answer. Why get the answer? Here you go. Here are the driver mutations, their frequency, and how we treat them. Up at the top, we have exon 18 and 19, our most common driver that we could treat. Below it, we have KRAS, actually the most common driver, which did not have a therapy until uh, four months ago. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, we've seen all of these mutations at Englewood. Some of the incidences are one to 2%, but I have them in my clinic and they're surviving for years. One note about our patient population, which is interesting. We have a lot of L58R. We have a, a Korean population here of non-smoking females and they are getting cancers in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And you know what? They gobble up osimertinib at a lower dose, and they're surviving their cancer, which is amazing for me. I can't go through the whole slide. It's just uh, not enough time. But what I want you to understand is that the driver mutations are not random. These are mutations in normal growth signals. And I know how people hate these pathways, but these are normal cellular pathways that the tumors have mutated. And in fact, the drugs that we use are oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors. It's a class of drug, they're enzyme inhibitors that block these critical pathways. And every month, a newer drug comes, comes along with a better binding cascade because what will happen in time is resistance. The tumor will figure out a way so that the, the ligand no longer binds and becomes resistant. So you have to find another way. There are some antibodies that are used. You see cetuximab at top, uh, transduzumab, and there's another uh, binding antibody called imivatinib that we use in exon 20. Uh, they bind at the extracellular domain. Time is moving fast. Let me just show you one study for us three. This is the improvement of tyrosine kinase directed therapy over doublet chemotherapy uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. You can see uh, median uh, progression, progression free survival of 10.1 month versus 4.1 month and a hazard ratio of 0 0.6. The TKI adverse events, they're mostly very well tolerated uh, diarrhea, somewhat rash. Um, skin things, scale, skin reactions, but basically these are fairly well tolerated nets that can be titrated uh, to adverse events. I've got two minutes on immunotherapy. Let's talk a little bit. PDO1, that's what we're talking about. We, we actually halt immune tolerance. Uh, people talk about uh, stopping the break of immune therapy, of, of, uh, of, and then that's what happens. I, I find that very difficult. If you look at the left side, what you're actually looking at is how a T cell recognizes a foreign antigen. How do I get rid of this? Okay. Yeah. So it's a two step process. Uh, there's a recognition with a major histocompatibility antigen on the right and PDL1 binding to its sites. This is tolerance. This T cell is not going to kill this cancer cell. What we've essentially done with PDL1. And you can see, you probably can do with other ligands, is if you block that PDL1 ligand with a PD1 ligand, you only have a one site recognition. That T cell sees this cancer cell as foreign. It's the same thing with rejection, and it will kill it. 
This is uh, the driver's negative uh, combinations that we talk about in uh, PDL1 less than 50%. You will have a chemotherapy backbone with the addition of immunotherapy. Special cases for PDL1 greater than 50% are the use of pembrolizumab alone. I don't have time to show all the studies, but rapidly, this is the second line approval of pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy. Rank et al, New England Journal of Medicine. Um, as you can see, a one year survival of 70% versus 50%. This was second line chemotherapy. This is the approval of chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy. Elegantly shown by Gandhi in the New England Journal of Medicine. The breakdowns are at the top PDL1 less than 1%, 1 to 49%, and 50%. All of these curves split. This is the backbone for most of our patients receiving chemotherapy and immunotherapy for two to four cycles, followed by immunotherapy until they relapse or have side effects. This is an immunotherapy option, time doesn't permit. Very rapidly, no free lunch. PDL1 has its own toxicities, uh, of which rash, severe diarrhea, um, hypothyroidism, hypoadrenalism, and pneumonitis uh, uh, can be very tough to treat. Can I continue? You want? Okay. Just really rapidly, uh, KRAS is exciting because it's, it's that it's very common. Uh, it's about 25 to 30 percent of the lung cancers we see, and conventionally does not do well with uh, with chemotherapy, immunotherapy. KRAS sits right below the EGFR receptor. It consists in two forms, active and inactive. They move back and forth. So they had to come up with a molecule that would bind only to the inactive form. They actually have that molecule, sotorasib. This is a swimmer's plot of the second line use of sotorasib after uh, chemotherapy failure and overall survival of 12 months. The drug is available. I'm currently here in Englewood trying to get the drug first line uh, from Amgen in our qualified patients. Two very rapid things to take home. This is non-metastatic disease. This is surgical adjuvant treatment where we now can add EGFR-directed therapy earlier on. And I just want to show you something because this is fantastic. After surgery and adjuvant chemotherapy, in stage two, three, we then give them two to three years of osimertinib. And you know what? The median disease-free survival not reached yet. These patients are living. And just recently, last month, oops, I lost my slide. Recently, last month, there was an adjuvant approval for PDL1 in stage two to three cancer. So now, after patients receive surgery and adjuvant chemotherapy, if their PDL1 is greater than 1%, they can receive adjuvant immunotherapy in the form of atelizumab for a period of two years with an improvement of overall survival. So I think it's exciting. We're gonna see these drugs move earlier on to neoadjuvant. We're waiting on the results of clinical trials. So we're gonna need that molecular data earlier on um, to be able to save lives. I uh, thank you for allowing me to run over a little bit. And uh, so um, a few observations. Number one, we used to go to national meetings and uh, the lectures about stage four lung cancer were very uh, brief. And if they weren't brief, they would demonstrate 20 or 30 interventions, uh, none of which really were significant. So uh, in, our, in our cancer center, we are really blessed to have such an experienced leader in Dr. Addis, who's been through it all. And now the other thing that for me is so wonderful is to see Lou smiling on a regular basis. Um, we have to keep our medical oncologists happy. They deal with uh, significant challenges. Um, I guess this is the uh, last uh, uh, speaker this uh, morning before we ha have our uh, uh, case presentations. And that is uh, uh, no other than Dr. David Dubin, who's chief of radiation oncology. Radiation oncology wow. has always been at the forefront of importance in treatment of lung cancer. And in the modern treatment, it has become quite specialized, incredible techniques, 
And uh, Dr. Dubin uh, uh, demonstrates significant experience and expertise. David will be talking about radiation therapy in early and late stage lung cancer. Thank you, Steve. Good morning. Um, I was asked to speak about early and late, uh, which was very apt because radiation therapy is indicated for many patients in early stage and late stage lung cancer, but not really in the middle. So patients who have N1 disease um, usually do not get radiation therapy. Um, for early stage patients um, in stage one to two A, that is tumors less than four centimeters with negative nodes, the standard of care is surgery. But many patients, as, uh, as we all know, have chronic lung disease, um, chronic cardiac disease, and for whatever reason are either unable to be operated on or refuse operation. In those patients, SBRT is ideal because early stage cancer is potentially curable with radiation. Um, and two smaller tumors do respond better. SBRT as a technique is preferable to more standard radiation techniques because of the ability to limit the dose to the surrounding lung. And as we know, lung is relatively radio sensitive. Um, by targeting the lesion, we are able to minimize the dose to the normal lung. Um, now, the studies imply equivalence of surgery and radiation therapy in these early stage tumors, but equivalence is a very slippery term. Um, patients who get surgery are usually uh, surgically staged, have um, mediastinoscopies, et cetera, whereas with radiation therapy, most patients do not get surgically staged. So when comparing apples and oranges, and it's likely that patients who get SBRT are not necessarily um, treating the entire, getting treated to the entire extent of disease if there is subclinical uh, tumor in the hyper or mediastinal nodes. Um, there are many challenges to giving radiation therapy to lung cancers, and they boil down to two words, people breathe. Um, tumors are moving throughout the breathing cycle, and the idea of radiation therapy to avoid as much lung as possible is to minimize the normal lung being treated. Um, Patients also breathe irregularly and they breathe with different baselines. And sometimes it's very difficult to know where a tumor is without many further um, methods to determine the exact location. Also tumors can be surrounded not only by normal lung, which is sensitive, but other sensitive structures such as the esophagus, the heart, brachial plexus, et cetera. Um, it's very important that we set patients up appropriately and accurately and using the old standards such as skin marks no longer applies. Um, there have been three attempted randomized controlled studies looking at radiation therapy versus surgery. They all failed to accrue, a pa to accrue patients. Two of the studies were, um, were combined in a meta-analysis and they again showed some equivalence but that's not as scientific as we'd like it to be. There are several studies now that are ongoing looking at SBRT versus surgery, but I'm not very uh, optimistic. Um, as mentioned, the, the tumors move and patients breathe. And as you can see on the left side of the uh, slide, um, by taking the tumor excursion and superimposing that on a CT slice, there's a large area that would need to be treated if we could not identify where the tumor is at any given time. So what we often will do is gate, which means we'll treat patients only on certain segments of their breathing cycle. And generally at end expiration, patients have a pause and we can therefore use that pause as our target for treatment. Um, looking at the right side of the slide, you see that by doing so, a smaller volume of, of lung needs to be treated and um, that will limit toxicity. There are several solutions, um, as I was hinting at before. One is actually to try to immobilize the tumor. We can press below the diaphragm, below the, beneath the, the xiphoid, um, and try to compress the diaphragm to the point where it cannot move more than several millimeters and rely on accessory muscles of respiration. That's somewhat uncomfortable, and we're using it less and less, but it is a rational and reasonable technique. Um, another option is gating, as I mentioned before. If we can identify where a tumor is not moving during the respiratory cycle, we can 
make sure that we can identify where the tumor is. Now that requires being able to um, uh, uh, requires being able to make sure that we are treating only in that part of the respiratory cycle. And we use a device that sits on the patient's chest called an RPM device that can um, give us a tracing as to the breathing cycle. Another option is what's um, illustrated on the right, which are radio frequency transponders. These markers are placed either by interventional radiology or by pneumonology. Um, and they are uh, literally antennas that are placed inside the patient. They are anchored with those claws, they call them legs. Um, and by surrounding a tumor with three markers, we can identify each of these markers within a tenth of a millimeter, 25 times a second, to make sure that we can know at least where the tumor is. And then using a uh, very sophisticated device to um, follow all three of the markers, we can see where the tumor is at all times. If all else fails, we will have to adjust the volumes, which again requires treating larger volumes of lung and therefore causing more side effects. Um, this is just a quick illustration of what we uh, do for, um, for use of these fiducial markers that I mentioned before. Um, this requires a lot of manpower. There's a physicist, radiation oncologist, two therapists, and probably several, several other people in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and the radio transmitter and receiver is that white board that sits over the patient. It is beaming the radio waves into the patient and then receiving the signal to um, make sure that we are set up properly. When we leave the room and treat the patient, we then get a tracing such as this. So um, with time going from right to left, the patient is taking a deep breath on the right side of the screen. And we can then follow each of the three um, coordinates, X, Y, and Z, to make sure that the tumor is not moving out of the range that we expect it to be. And the, that range is about three millimeters on either side of the baseline. And you can see that the patient's tumor stays within that, those three lines. Um, the scalloping you see on the tracing is actually cardiac motion. So that's something that we haven't quite gotten rid of yet, but uh, you never know. Now, patient, as I mentioned before, patients in stage two, um, meaning having a positive hyaluronidopathy are not usually treated with radiation therapy. There are actually studies of postoperative radiation that show that the results are worse with radiation than no radiation. And the thought is that, that the, is not because of less tumor control, but rather more toxicity in the lung and heart. Um, since those studies were done, new techniques have developed, such as motion management, as I showed before, and there are new studies that are ongoing looking at postoperative radiation, even in N1 disease. The patients with N2 disease, um, this slide is to uh, kind of remind me that some N2 patients are not operable, um, and those inoperable patients should be treated with chemo radiation. Um, there are, of course, many patients who are operable, and those patients really, according to the NCCN guidelines, can be treated surgically or with chemo radiation. And looking a little further into this, I uh, did a little research while I was looking up uh, studies for this talk, and I found that about half of the large departments in the country treat patients with chemo radiation in stage 3A, half treat patients surgically. And there really is no rhyme or reason. I think it's more of an institutional um, situation. Um, now, just as it's important to try to minimize lung volumes when we treat patients with SDRT, maybe even more so it's important for patients with more advanced disease because as tumors grow larger, the amount of lung that needs to be treated gets larger. Um, Let's click out of that. Okay. So this uh, somewhat confusing thing on the right, upper right is what's called a DVH. It's a dose volume histogram. It tells me what volume of what organ is getting what dose. The blue line is the lung. I'm sorry, the blue line is the uh, spinal cord. And you can see that with, SB, with SBRT or IMRT, you can get a much lower dose to the spinal cord. But spinal cord is not as important as you might think. Um, 
the idea of uh, using IMRT or 3, 3D therapy is with trying to minimize the dose to the lung. Um, the lung dose that we try to look at is the volume that's receiving 20 gray, 2,000 rads. And you can see on this graph that the purple lines come together near 2,000 rads, which means that there's not always a better treatment. It has to be individualized. Some patients are better candidates for IMRT. Some are better for SBR, for um, 3D therapy. And unfortunately, a study just came out in our Bible, the red journal that shows that patients getting, M or that stated that the patients getting IMRT had a 30% lower um, V20, volume receiving 20 gray. Unfortunately, that's not always true, and patient treatment really has to be individualized. Now, as our field progresses and as we integrate our field with the rapidly um, evolving chemotherapy land, uh, and immunotherapy and targeted therapy um, landscape, we hope that uh, radiation can be integrated and help to improve survival and cure more patients. Thank you. Okay, so. We're running about uh, 10 minutes uh, late, so I'm going to take the prerogative as the moderator to skip our break and move directly into our Q&A uh, and be courteous to all of you with uh, your time. Um, so I have submitted from the chat room a number of uh, questions, and uh, we'll move directly uh, into that. So the first question is about... Uh, uh, screening. Um, if a patient has a strong family history of lung cancer, but doesn't fall into the strict criteria, should they be screened? Dr. Shapiro? The answer is absolutely. We have to keep in mind that these guidelines from the literature and the studies that were performed tailored on our age and smoking history. But what happens in the United States is the insurance companies get a hold of these guidelines and say, these are the only patients we're going to pay for these studies reimbursement. And that is not the correct way to manage these patients. So if there's any ancillary factors, clinical factors, strong family history, everything has to be taken into account. But absolutely, we can screen in patients outside these guidelines. Thank you. Um, two questions related to surgery for Dr. Stavropoulos and Dr. Bernstein. Are there situations where an otherwise fit patient with negative N2 lymph nodes, no evidence of distant disease, would not be offered curative uh, surgery? And uh, the second question is, under what circumstances would you not approach a lung cancer resection with minimally invasive approaches, bats or robot? So um, I typically would start every uh, lung cancer surgery thoracoscopically at the, at, at the minimum. Um, there's no harm in putting in a scope and assessing uh, the extent of disease. And quite honestly, there are times when, uh, when you do have uh, a large lesion that during thoracoscopy, you can un uh, unveil progression of disease, uh, including a pleural effusion, perhaps studying, perhaps um, uh, a lesion that now would uh, uh, require a pneumonectomy as opposed to a lobectomy. So all these changes can be sometimes unveiled with simply putting in a scope and not having submitted the patient to a thoracotomy. So at the very least, um, there are cases where I, I uh, go in thinking that I will need to do a thoracotomy. However, I will always begin with a thoracoscopy just so that uh, I may be able to glean information that can spare the patient a thoracotomy. Um, and then as far as uh, negative N2 fit patient, are there lesions that are unresectable? Uh, yes, if they uh, infiltrate the heart, maybe not the atria, because I've resected and block with atrial resections. If they uh, in infiltrate the great vessels like the aorta, even though I'm sure there are places that may have even done that, um, sometimes uh, infiltrating the spine or the vertebrae can be very difficult. And sometimes uh, if they infiltrate the certain portions of the carina, those would be uh, uh, surgeries that would probably be too morbid even for a lot of fit patients. Thank you. Next question is for our pathologist and medical oncologist. A non-smoking Asian female presents with malignant uh, effusion. PGL1 is 60%. 
uh, next generation sequencing and liquid tumor biopsy are pending. What should the next steps be? Actually, a real patient. And um, I have such a patient. And the first thing we do is uh, we, we manage the pleural effusion. She probably will get a pleurex. In today's day and age, with an Asian non smoking female, my confidence in a driver of mutation is probably 50 to 60% that they will have it. So I think you have to wait for the NGS or the uh, uh, CT DNA testing to show that, that it's present or absent. Um, you've got time to use PDL1 therapy. So in, in this case, I would wait for it. The differences are astounding. I mean, patients who get driver gene mutation therapy, she may be around for five years. If you use chemotherapy and, and, and with PDL1 therapy, we're looking at more modest two to three years survival. So you give the patient the better benefit of the doubt. The second reason is that if you swap from one therapy to the other, let's say we give her chemo immunotherapy day one, and then we want then go to targeted therapy, the incidence of side effects go way up with the addition of uh, EGFR therapy after immunotherapy. So all those things we talked about, rash, diarrhea, pneumonitis, the incidence goes sky high. So if I'm stuck and I have to treat this person, they get chemotherapy day one. We leave out the immunotherapy. If indeed we change, we can then go right on to guided therapy. And, and from pathology, I think we're all acutely aware of the timeliness and the, you know doing this testing early. And I think that brings the importance of communication and a multidisciplinary approach where we know from the very beginning if this patient is metastatic or locally advanced or metastatic, we get the testing uh, done early uh, to make sure that the testing is available by the time the patient sees the Just oncologist. One further point, the turnaround time for liquid biopsy today, and I would love pathology to come close, is seven to 10 days. So if you send out a serum today on your patient, you will, get, you will get it back by a week from Monday. And for tissue testing, it's usually two weeks. So we're, we have a little bit of a, uh, we beat them by a little bit. So can I ask a quick question, Tis? Uh, when we extract uh, what would be obvious malignant pleural effusion, how often do you find that you have enough cells and tissue specimen to actually run uh, genomic testing? It, it really depends. So um, it depends on the concentration of tumor cells in the pleural effusion. We do have certain techniques where we spin down the pleural effusion to concentrate the cells so they, um, uh, to concentrate them. So we, um, we uh, try to do everything to, to maximize the tumor content in the cell block that we uh, perform. But uh, we have done uh, molecular testing on pleural effusion and have gotten results. So that's not an uncommon scenario, I think. I would say maybe half of the time it will be sufficient test, uh, sufficient tumor amount, um, but there are cases where there's just too few tumor cells to even attempt it. So let's go to our last question for uh, Dr. Dubin. Um, I think you covered a significant amount of this, but um, uh, how do you think SBRT has impacted the treatment of lung cancer and uh, how often are patients with uh, early stage lung cancers in your center treated with SBRT? Well, SBRT has impacted it a great deal for the, for the very fact that previously patients who were not resectable did not have any great options. Now they have an option that is potentially curative. Um, local control rates are about 90%. On the other hand, I think the Utility of SBRT really is dependent upon the availability of other modalities. So now that we're doing subsegmental resections um, and we're using less invasive techniques, we're able to operate on patients who previously could not be operated on. So in a way, there are fewer patients who are great SBRT candidates because those patients may actually be better surgical candidates. Just to add, add to those comments, we are seeing more multifocal disease. Uh, that Dr. Gorenstein had mentioned. Uh, we're resecting some of them, but then when the patient doesn't have any more lung to give, they make great candidates for SBRT. So we comp our, our modalities complement each other and can actually uh, achieve good outcomes and, and uh, prognosis. It's going to be a conversation back and forth between yeah. the, 
thoracic surgeon and radiation therapy because these patients are going to need, require more than one resection in their lifetime. And that goes for most lung cancer patients. One quick kudo for SBRT, though, that we didn't cover that we see very commonly in lung is that he has totally changed the forefront of brain metastasis, single brain metastasis, oligometastasis, at the same time as finding the primary tumor, SBRT has become the treatment of choice. So no question about it. One last question from me, from the podium. Um, so if you are a tertiary care community hospital treating lung cancer patients, what are the minimal requirements required to be confident that uh, we are delivering a, a program that is of the highest standards? I think for us, it's clear this morning, uh, the, the, the multidisciplinary expertise that we have uh, demonstrated here. But uh, what do you think that a, a good community hospital should uh, be able to deliver and what are the necessary requirements? Lou, do you want to Yeah, so, so we, we meet and, and set our own guidelines, but they're very closely allied with national cancer guidelines. So we want to be within, at least within NCCN guidelines for all of our aspects of our therapy. And we also want to keep abreast of the what is up to date, what is, what is new and novel, and what are clinical trials both available in our area, as well as clinical trials that we can do here to push the forefront of therapy. I mean, for me, the next thing is going to be neoadjuvant immunotherapy. I'm really excited to try to be able to bring that. Let's to quickly go through the panel. Dr. Shapiro, what about screening? Screening, we need the highest technology, the equipment, and the interpretation following the lung rads is very specific guidelines put forth by the American College of Radiology to minimize false positives and to make sure these patients get appropriate follow-up. Dr. Stavropoulos? From a surgical standpoint, I think we should advocate for minimally invasive approaches <coughs> because they have been shown to be uh, oncologically equivalent to prior thoracotomies. I think uh, uh, with Dr. Gorenstein offering thoracoscopy, myself offering robotics, I think we have that covered pretty well. Uh, but I do think that that is considered the standard when it comes to anatomic lung resection and lung cancer. So we do that well here. Um, and, I, um, and I think a multidisciplinary approach of when to actually take patients to surgery. Excellent. Radiation oncology? From the radiation oncology point of view, I think there are two aspects. One is the, techno the technology. We're very technology um, heavy. Um, it's important to stay in the forefront of, of uh, the technological uh, aspects of radiation. We were um, the first or the second in the area to use uh, real-time tracking for lung fiducial markers. Um, the other thing is communication. As, as we keep talking about, it's very important that we all get together, talk about these patients at tumor boards, at multidisciplinary meetings, just to make sure that patients are on the right pathway. And from technology, um, I think we're sort of trying to do more and more with less and less. I think we're trying to get uh, less invasive techniques, trying to do more with high needle aspiration or with endobronchial ultrasound aspirates. So we're always looking at techniques that uh, are able, we are able to analyze, um, ne do next gen sequencing on um, FNA material um, and do it in a more timely fashion. Thanks. And finally, David, diagnostics? Yeah, for diagnostics, just like Dr. Dubitz said, I think technology is the most important aspect, especially with navigation bronchoscopy. You know, they've come up with new technology where we are able to do robotic navigation bronchoscopy, which will also um, hopefully with, you know, more software will allow for better accuracy and orientation to the lung uh, nodules. Um, in addition to that, more uh, you know, ongoing tools, you know, with uh, not only do we have APC, we can you know, use cryo to help us manage also any type of uh, airway tumors and whatnot. So advancement in technology and, you know, investment in your tools, uh, along with the guidelines of the nation, I think it's going to be important for us. Thank you. Thank you all. So before we conclude this very comprehensive symposium, um, I want to really thank all of our speakers this morning who not only demonstrate extraordinary expertise, but you can see, I hope all of the participants, the collegiality here and the familiarity and the frequency with which these experts come together 
on a, a daily basis to um, uh, formulate uh, uh, plans for our, for our patients. And I'm sure it's the same way in your own cancer centers. I also want to recognize the almost 200 of you who are uh, joining us uh, via Zoom. And um, if you have uh, any particular questions specifically for our experts, you can contact our administrator. Her email is on the, uh, uh, was de distributed to all of you, and we will forward it to the- Feel free uh, to come to our tumor board. To the experts. And um, finally, again, we're offering a, a CME category one for the symposium. And again, if you have any difficult, uh, any difficulty accessing that, please contact us. And um, uh, we want to thank you for being with us at our annual cancer symposium. And good luck with your uh, treatment of uh, lung cancer patients. And lastly, I want to salute all of the cancer survivors in the room or on the web uh, uh, who have uh, experienced these diseases yourself. Thank you very much.